you're racing in for Christie, you better be ready. Here comes Christie. One of the fastest human beings on the planet. What a devastating piece of news. Lenford tested positive. I'm not afraid to admit I cried. They finally got him, but I'm not going to get into that. So he can run tomorrow. He's yeah. free to run. Yes. And Christie's going to do it. And Christie has won it. Records are made to be broken. Medals stay with you forever. Are right, you guys ready? 24 major medals, 10 golds. Linford Christie is right up there in the all-time great British sportsman, no doubt about it. Nobody can come and tell me that there was anybody bigger in British athletics in any event than Linford Christie. To rank in purely on athletics performances is one thing. Um, I think he ranks differently if you just think of him as a person, as a character within British sporting history. Miss it? No, I don't miss running them at all, no. Not at all. Not at all. Don't miss it. Great athletes, great sportsmen are not necessarily the most um, uh, wonderful of people outside of the arena. And Linford had his dark days as far as we were concerned. Linford, what are you going to say? I think his success probably came at a cost to him. Sometimes he was, I think, misunderstood. He didn't get the real Linford in the public eye. He was the target. You only have to write one thing about somebody and they react in a certain way, understandably, for then everybody's going to come in and try and write something for a reaction. If I talk to them, they change it. If I don't talk to them, they lie about it. The famous Derek Redman quote about um, perfectly balanced human, he's got a chip on both shoulders, summed him up absolutely perfectly. The media believes they make you or they break you. They don't make me. I make myself. He always fought his own corner. Linford, and I think you'd go back to the kid that arrived at the age of seven in this country and realize you, if you don't fight your own corner, you get trampled on. Now, I came to England when I was seven, and I think I came in September in 67. It was nice and warm, and I thought, oh, it was okay, and then the winter started. And I remember the first time I saw snow, I ran outside, you know, with my younger brother, and we you know, opened our mouths and the snow was falling in and then fingers got cold. <laughs> That's my first, you know, kind of memories of England. Cold. <laughs> <laughs> Gloves are not good. No, you need mittens. <laughs> 60s Britain was not always an easy place growing up. No, it wasn't really, and I, I suppose that's probably where I learned to run because, you know, the guys, you know, would gang up on you, you know, want to beat you up because, you know, I think there was maybe about two or three black kids in the whole school when I was there. Use your arms, drop the shoulders, keep it bouncing, keep bouncing, bounce it. I ran across the playground one day after, you know, a game of football, and there was a teacher looking out his window, a teacher called Mr. Wright. He came down straight away and he said, oh, you look like you can run, would you like to try out for the school team? You know, I don't even think I even won a race. <laughs> you know, some of the kids were a little bit quicker than I was, but, you know, there just always seemed to be a teacher that was pushing me in the direction to be you know, to be an athlete, I suppose. Right through the line, right through the line! Turn Valley Aries moved from Alberton to this track in 1972. And then in 1979, there's another club who used this track as well, London Irish. And one of their athletes was along Tall Street with a mop of air, which I can't remember exactly what they used to call it, but it was a mop of air. And effort, effort. that was Linford. He could definitely run, there's no doubt about that, but uh, <laughs> anything else I wasn't too sure about. We did have some problems with late nights at weekends and other things like that. I was a normal teenager, I reckon. You know, I, I went out with my mates, of course. I lived at home until I was 23 years old. So, you know, my parents were staunch Christians. The party scene wasn't the kind of thing that you did. So I suppose when I got an opportunity, you know, then of course I, you know, I kind of made the most of it. They enjoyed their nights out and they come down Sunday morning and start the training, but they might not finish the training. And we usually found him on the cover area fast asleep because he'd been out the night before again. I didn't realise, I suppose, what you could actually get out of being an athlete. And it wasn't until some of the other guys started getting internationals and everything else. And then you realise, oh, hang on a minute, you know, I don't want to be left behind because these guys are making a team and you know, I'm going to be just, you know, another one of those guys who came close. He had a couple of races where he ran really well, and you could see there was talent there. 
But he was still messing about, he was still finding out when the parties were and coming down late, not being able to do the training properly. And I just got fed up with it. So instead of talking to him, I just sent him a letter. But what I didn't know was at the same time, Andy Norman, who's one of the top officials, he sent him a very similar letter. Andy Norman was the ringmaster for British athletics. He gave him a kick up the backside when he needed it. Andy's view was very simple. Train hard for nine months a year, run your legs off for three. That's the life of an athlete. We both said virtually the same. Linford, you've got talent, but stop wasting your talent. Buckle down to it and you'll become number one. I talked to my grandmother about it. She said, well, give it a go, try. You know, never want to go through life saying if only. Good, clean start. Christie away well, but uh, Tullock's pushing him, but Christie looking good. Tullock looking equally good at this stage. It's going to be close between those two. Christie coming through on the inside, and Christie wins it. 84 to 85 was the first time he really trained in the winter. And results were very apparent. 25 years old, Linford Christie of Thames Valley Harriers takes his place in this final of the men's 200 metres. 86 was his big breakthrough with the European indoors. The British camp have high hopes that Linford Christie can take the silver medal behind the favourite Yevgenyev, who's made a storming start and is coming up to Christie's shoulder. Reskanov of the Soviet Union is the man who is surely the biggest threat to Linford Christie, lifting that silver medal. Yevgenyev comes into the whole shade of the lead, and Christie's even closing on him, and Christie's won it! Christie has won the gold medal! It was a big breakthrough. No one thought he could run a 200. Now he will get the headlines he has craved for so long. A tremendous performance, that one by Linford Christie, and the man uh, with uh, just about the biggest smile in Madrid is <laughs> alongside me now. Linford, you've got a gold medal here. You can't possibly have expected to do that. No, I mean, I came here expected just to make the final. Getting the goal is great, yeah. What haven't we heard of Linford Christie before this year? I don't know, really. I mean, I've been around for quite a long time and, you know, it's just that I suppose nobody was interested in me because they felt that I haven't done anything. How do you finance yourself? Well, I sign on, you know. It is an embarrassment, really, to have to admit to it, but that's my only source of income. It changed my life completely because I thought, if I could do this, then what else can happen? And I started realising that's the kind of work you got to put in. Everyone went mad, the press went mad. At that particular time, the papers were nicer. It changed later on. Away from the track, there were problems, weren't there? There's the problem with the police. The thing is, like, when I got my GB tracksuit, I remember I was so proud. I walked along Shepherd's Bush. This policeman started saying, you know, what's a nigger like you doing a British tracksuit and all this kind of stuff? Went into the, ch the chip shop, as you do, you know, because those days you can eat what you want. And I remember I came out of the shop and he jumped me. You know, he twisted my arm behind my back and they, they just arrested me. You know, so, you know, we went through that. The next day, I, you know, I had to go to Marlebone, you know, court, and they dropped all charges. You know, it was just so, you know, stupid. And then, you know, again, we were all sponsored by Budget Rent a Car. We had the XR3. The police came. They said, can I have a word? I said, one second, I'm just going to jog. Because I thought you wanted an autograph. <laughs> so, you know, and he goes, uh, is this your car? I said, yes, this is my car. He said, it's stolen. I said, no, it can't be. I mean, it's a sponsored car. I've got papers at home to prove that it's my car. And he said, no, you need to give me the keys. So I said, no, I'm not giving you the keys. So he said, you're under arrest. Took me down to Shelbush Police Station. A couple of days later, they dropped a letter in at my parents' house and said, you know, you don't need to come back no more. We've done our inquiries and everything else. So I said, you know, I still want an apology and they totally refused. After they realised I wasn't going to go away, they went to the newspapers and told the newspapers that I was arrested for stealing a car and if I, you know, if implicated, I faced so many years in prison after they told me everything was over. So then I decided, you know, I'm going to get a solicitor. I went to a guy called Jeffrey Bindman and he told me, of course you've got a case. You know, he went on and on and then the day of court, they decided they were going to apologise. It was just so, Stupid. Linford spent the early part of his life in his home country, but uh, regards himself very much as a British athlete. Britain's all I know.
People say, well, you know, you're Jamaican. Yes, I, you know, I was born in Jamaica, but, you know, I class myself as being British. Welcome to Stuttgart on the European Athletics Championships and the final of the men's 100 metres. Linford Christie of Great Britain in lane three. There was some good names, even, um, I suppose, Alan Wells at the time was the best British sprinter. I suppose he was up there as one of the favourites to do well. A clean start. Let's look for Wells making his usual good start. Indeed he did, and Wells is leading, but here comes Christie. It's between those two, Wells fading, but Christie gets the goal. The European indoor champion over 200 metres is now the European 100 metres champion. And for Christie, all along, you've told us you're going to win the gold medal here. Is this an element now, have I told you so? It is, I told you so. I mean, I always knew all along, you know, I'm the best here. The more you win, the more you feel, yeah, I can do better, I can do better. You know, that was it for me, you know, I thought, you know, if I can win Europeans, then, you know, what else can I win? The world record has gone again to Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson just blew them apart. And then later on, we find out why he blew them apart. Everybody was up for a drug story. It just happened to be, you know, the number one man in the British team. All these people claiming to be the fastest people in the world, how could they be the fastest if I never raced them? And that's how cocky I was, you know, I thought, you know, you can't be the fastest if you haven't, you haven't raced me. Running here in lane five is Ben Johnson of Canada, the Commonwealth champion and the runner of the fastest time ever achieved for 100 metres at sea level, 9.95. I really liked Ben Johnson. Well, the Canadians on a whole, we got, we, we all got on, you know, pretty well. I mean, I found, you know, Ben, he was a down-to-earth guy. Many people's favourite, Carl Lewis, running in lane six, Olympic and reigning world champion. Carl, we call him like the Michael Jackson, you know, of athletics. Not that you can sing that way, but, you know, he just, he was so aloof, he didn't talk to you. Do you then feel threatened by Britain's Linford Christie? <gasps> I feel threatened by no one. Limford Christie believes that he can win the highest prize of all, the European champion and United Kingdom record holder. At 27, the oldest finalist in this field. A good clean start. Johnson first out of the blocks. Lewis pursuing him. Christie coming on strong, nearest to the camera. It's going to be Johnson, surely. It's a magnificent victory. Johnson takes it in 9.84. Lewis second. A fantastic new world record. Christie seemed to be injured as he crossed the line. In fourth place, I made it. Now, here at these World Championships, there have been all sorts of stories flying around about the drug taking that's been going on. And when I spoke to Carl earlier today, he had one or two things he wanted to get off his chest about that drug issue. There are gold medalists in this meet already that are definitely on drugs. There'd been a lot of rumors beforehand about Ben Johnson. Most people said it was just Carl Lewis being bitter about being beaten by Ben Johnson. Carl Lewis thought he was number one, and he didn't like losing that number one tag. Ben, you feel you're even faster? Next year, I'm going all out in Seoul. I'm going to improve my, my speed, my endurance, everything next year. I honestly thought I could beat him. I really, really did. You know, I always say to people, you know, I've never been in a race where I never thought I could win. I'm pretty positive about what's going to go on because, you know, I think I'll feature in there somewhere. We were hoping that Linford would pull off the impossible and would finish ahead of Carl and Ben, and he gave it his best shot, but we didn't know at the time what had gone around. We studied Ben and how he ran and everything else because we knew Carl didn't start quick, but he had come through like a train. Ben would just get out and we thought he's going to die to 60. Ben got out, and we thought, oh, we could pull him back, he's going to die. And instead of dying, he just kept going. <laughs> Away first time, Johnson made a magnificent start. Lewis coming on strong, Linford Christie going well between them as well. It's Johnson in the lead. Johnson's going to win it. Lewis second of the bronze medal for Linford Christie. And it's 9.79, the world record has gone again to Ben Johnson. Incredible. New European record. I ran 997, and me, I was chuffed with that. And it's gone down in history. Ben Johnson has done it again. Ben Johnson just blew them apart. 
And then later on, we find out why he blew them apart. The race has gone down in history for so many reasons, um, so many of the wrong reasons, uh, spearheaded by a short Canadian guy called Ben Johnson. Not even a smile or a suggestion of it. I got a call from London at four in the morning saying, uh, Jim, we want you to get round to the studio very, very quickly. Ben Johnson has uh, tested positive. We got Linford out of bed and he spoke to us. You know what I thought was funny about that? I still had to compete. You know, and the team management woke me up to go out there and, and, and talk about it. I had to compete, but, you know, the, I suppose the breaking story, you know, of the Ben Johnson, you know, drug scandal was more important. The urine sample of Ben Johnson was found to contain the metabolites of a banned substance, namely stanozolol. Good evening. What a devastating piece of news. Olympic glory has turned to shame. Ben Johnson, whose sprint to victory in the 100-meter dash on Friday earned him a gold medal, has tested positive for the banned anabolic steroid Stanozol. If you could cut him into a million pieces and test him over again, my brother is not on drugs. It would seem to be one of the really big first drug busts, as it were, for a big blue ribbon event sprinter, so it was a big shock. Linford's medal got upgraded to silver. I think he was quite reluctant actually to hand over the bronze medal that he felt he'd, he'd won by right. Linford Christie on the brink perhaps of another Olympic medal. A clean start. The Olympic final of the men's 200 meters underway. Deloach has made a tremendous start. Christie running well in the middle. Deloach just in front. Christie just behind him. De Silva and here comes Carl Lewis. And Carl Lewis is hitting the front, but Deloach is holding on. But Lewis is going to do it, or is he? Deloach, Lewis, Silver, the medalist, Christie in four. You saw the Ben Johnson story unveiling, and then it was kind of like a massive surge of, well, hang on, let's see what else we can find. Who else can we pull and have an issue with? Because that's what it seemed like to me when I was watching it. It's like they were trying to find things on people at the same time to basically just blow up the whole race. I can't let you go without asking you about Ben Johnson. 24 hours later, just give us your feelings about the whole affair. Well, you know, I, I'm not afraid to admit I cried because I know Ben the person. And it was very, very sad for me that, you know, such a thing happened. Also, it was a sad day for athletics. But in a way, I'm glad he had on the rest day. And regardless, I mean, I still have a lot of respect for Ben because, as I said, I know him as a person. And it's just a tragedy, really. Everybody was up for a drug story. Everybody was waiting who's going to be next. Just happened to be, you know, the number one man in the British team. We weren't surprised he was a sprinter. We were surprised it was Linford Christie and a Brit because the British team seemed to have done so much work to make sure that these guys were tested before they went to the Olympics. Now, moving on to your own situation, this was after the 200, was it not? That's right, yes. They tell you that there is an abnormality in the reading which has been given to you. How did you feel, first of all? Like when, shit. When somebody, <laughs> thought, how did you, how like, did you feel when somebody told you? I can use that word. I felt like shit. I'm not even going to lie. I felt like shit because my thing is, I when I when I decide to do sport, there's there's rules and regulations of the sport. If you want to take drugs or you want to cheat, go and do something else. And they found a drug called pseudoephedrine, which is a stimulant, which um, has the effect of giving you a lift. Linford's explanation for this was that he'd been drinking the uh, Chinese ginseng tea, had no understanding that this contained anything illegal, thought it was just a natural product. And he always used a Korean ginseng, but he ran out of that. The only stuff he could take was some Chinese ginseng. What he didn't know, the Chinese put a minute amount of ephedrine, a very minute amount. It wouldn't stimulate a bloody ant, let alone someone the size of Linford. I didn't even know what ephedrine was. Didn't even, never even heard of the word. And I cried, you know, I ain't gonna even, I cried a lot. But then, you know, what could you do? Luckily, GB team had someone on their side who was a lawyer. He was fortunate to have Robert Watson. He was fortunate that Watson forced the committee to make its verdict then and then. He kept the meeting going till three o'clock in the morning. Most of the um, panel were exhausted, they want to go home. Linford Christie has also been in and described to the commission that he has taken no drugs whatsoever. They decided that 
what he'd taken was not justifiable drug taking. And Robert Watson told me years later that uh, he reckoned that 12 voted for Linford, 11 against, and two were fast asleep. So in that sense, he was lucky. Well, in the early hours of this morning, Christie was exonerated after more than two hours protesting his innocence before the medical commission. We give to the athletes, after a long uh, explanation and discussion on this typical case, the benefit of the doubt. Prince Dimmerode used the word benefit of the doubt, which is something that, you know, some, you know, the journalists live on. It's uh, not considered like a doping case. So he can run tomorrow, he's yeah. free to run. Yes. I described it as a storm in a ginseng teacup, which I still believe it was. He was not regarded as one of the many drug takers, but it fueled everybody's suspicions. And the way he was dealt with by sports writers, athletics writers, for most of the rest of his career was with a modicum of suspicion. You know, I was one of the main you know, opposition against drugs and sport. You know, the thing about it now, they've almost lost my voice. I mean, me being the main supporter of it and the way they treated me, I, I think that's, you know, set everything, you know, 50 years back. He didn't come out of that the way he should have been, which was completely clean, apologies, very sorry. That never happened to this day. That's never happened, and that's wrong. And Britain on the inside, what can they do here? The West Germans are ahead of us at the moment. Linford Christie coming through in the middle. Can he do it? The Soviets in front. It's a silver medal for Britain behind the Soviet Union. I was just, you know, kind of relieved at the end of it. And, you know, I came away with two medals. The second silver medal for a delighted Linford Christie, who said later of the drug controversy, I've been to hell and back. You can't dwell on it for too long. You know, you just got to decide, OK, you know, this is what's happened by the grace of God. You know, I'm, you know, I'm through this and you just got to move on. It's the greatest thing and sportsmen can win. And all they can say about it is Linford Christie's lunchbox. And it's that respect. I didn't realise that. They can just say what they feel about you and get away with it. It's Lewis and Christie. And now Christie hits the front. That was the toughest race I'd ever been in. I suppose, you know, single-handedly, you know, I revolutionised, uh, you know, Lycra and the outfit. Whether it's good or bad, I'm not sure, because, you know, Lycra hides a multitude of sins. <laughs> Publicity-wise, it was very good. But I think some of them were a bit outrageous. The public kept wondering, what is he going to wear this time? So, God, we've done the bones, you know, when I was sponsored by Milk, we did that. We went to Scotland, we did a tartan, we did, the, you know, like the James Bond, the one that turned out to look more like a waiter's uniform. <laughs> he promised us a very special outfit. I think the public liked it. It was something different. Just listen to that reception. To my rivals, I, I remember a couple of guys I raced, and when I stood there, came out of my outfit, they were laughing so much they couldn't concentrate, which, of course, enabled me to, <laughs> to go out there and, you know, and win. But, you know, if you don't win, then People think, oh God, where is he going? Waste man. <laughs> After the heats, I knew I was going to win it. I knew Leroy was the fastest guy there, but he had the least experience. I know that I'm going to be hard to beat. You know, whether Linford's up to that challenge or not is up to him. We got to the final, and he full started. That's nerves. That's nerves. I always get my best start in the final. So, you know, I know how to concentrate and when everyone's doing all their thing around, you know, my focus is just to try and get for me to be as quick as possible. You can see just in Linford's eyes, that look that everybody knows he has, that it, he wanted it more. If I was one of his competitors, I would look at Linford and think, he, he, he's convinced he's going to win. Not a great start from Burrell. Frankie Fredericks, Dennis Mitchell up there, but here comes Christie. Christie hits the front. He's coming away. He's going to do it. He's going to take the gold. The Olympic champion is Linford Christie. When I crossed the line, I was expecting this feeling, this euphoria to take over me, and you know, and 
it never happened. <laughs> you know, I was waiting for it to happen. And I suppose I was expecting too much. Linford Christie. Funny story I read somewhere. It was a family and they were jumping up so much cheering. And after they'd stopped, the little girl was still cheering, cheering and, you know, crying. And they thought, oh, God, she's patriotic. And then they realised the dog had bitten her. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I went out, 100%, I went out there to represent my country. The best feeling of winning, you know, and the championships is when you stand on that podium and they play God Save the Queen. Linford's stature after winning in Barcelona was absolutely huge as it should be, because there was nobody quicker and he had the Olympic gold medal. Yes, there were the rumblings after um, in terms of press and stuff, which he wasn't happy with, which is totally understandable because some of them were disrespectful. We'd just crowned an Olympic champion. Right, I've got to ask the next one. When The Sun had the famous headlines mm. and they start talking about Linford's lunchbox, what was your initial reaction? I seem to remember, <laughs> at the first off, you were, pre you were pretty hacked off. I was. I did not be in... So like the day after I won the Olympics, then maybe we could have had a laugh about it. It's the greatest thing and sportsmen can win. And all they can say about it is Linford Christie's lunchbox. Now, is that respect? <laughs> I took it personal because it's, you know, I class that as being racist, you know, and, you know, I just didn't think it was a good message to send out. You should be watching my form when I'm running. The fact that I'm winning, not what's in my shorts. I mean, that is not a part well, of the package. Well, unfortunately, that's what the issue's become. No, because you see... Well, why? No, why? Why? Well, well, it has with a lot of women are fascinated by no, it, for starters. Stereotyping the black man, right. No, no, that's no, right. I don't accept that. The thing to say there is it wasn't an athletics writer or even a sports writer. It came from left field in a different part of the newspaper. We didn't have a whole lot of sympathy for him generally because of how he could treat us on occasions, but on that occasion, certainly, um, we felt for him it wasn't fair. I didn't realise that they can just say what they feel about you and get away with it, but I got to the stage where, you know, I think, hang on a minute, I'm a grown man, and if you can say something about me, then why can't I tell you what you say about me and I, that I don't like it? Of course, these, you know, they didn't like it. I pulled up a few journalists and I said, listen, you wrote this about me and I didn't think. And they said, can we go in the corner and talk? So I said, no, we can't go in the corner and talk because when you write about me, you know, millions of people read this. And now I'm going to tell you what I think about you, but do you want to go in a corner? If you can't take it, don't give it. He gave us plenty of, plenty of stories to write, but he made our lives, if not difficult, certainly not as easy as they could be. They used to say, when a writer comes to write against your name, he writes not how you won, how you lost, but how you played a game. Our guys mm. don't know that. And they are the, you ask any media from anywhere else on the circuit, they, British press are discouraged. They, they do not realise that they are a part of the British team just as much as we are. We're supposed to be on the same side, the same team, and I don't expect the people who are supposed to be on my team to knock me. And that's, and that's, how, I, you know, that's how I felt. I'm really fed up with all the squabbling. All I want to do, I just want to run. It's just another race for me, and it's not, you know, it's built up like it's beginning the end of the world, you know, and there's more emphasis and importance placed on this race than they do about the World Championships. Millions of fans all around the world will be tuning in to this intriguing clash between two of the fastest human beings on Earth. Both of them at the very top of their profession. Carl Earth kept saying Linford wouldn't have won the Olympics if he'd been there. Or we kept saying, well, you did the trials. You weren't the top American, so you weren't there. Stop making excuses. I'm the world record holder. Uh, I can run with anybody, and I can beat anybody when I run my best. I have never dodged anybody. I've always raced the best, because I think in order to be the best, you have to race the best. £100,000 for each athlete, and the race will be over in around 10 seconds. Not bad work if you can get it. Dash for the cash, sprint for the mint, or just simply run for the money. It's an event that really goes way beyond the often very enclosed world of athletics. Men's 100 metres, then. The confrontation between Christie, lane four, and Lewis, lane five. Away this time, and Christie made the best start. Christie leading at the moment, Drummond going very well too from the United States. Here comes Linford Christie, Lewis some way behind, and Christie, for the moment anyway, is number one. It was a proper good event. 
and Linford won it, and um, all power to him. His great is the king. <laughs> well, in my dad's eyes, I'm the king. <laughs> Was there ever a, uh, a tiny bit of you which would have liked to have had the world record at some stage? Uh, not for me, John. I'm one of the few people who never talked about world records. Never interested me at all. Records are made to be broken. Medals stay with you forever. 93 was probably Linford's greatest achievement. That was a race where he proved to everybody but especially to Carl Lewis, that he was number one. Linford Christie is the European champion, the Commonwealth champion, the Olympic champion, now the world final. Carl Lewis, the threat. Good start from Lewis. Here comes Christie. It's Lewis and Christie. And now Christie hits the front. Kaysen's there as well. But Christie's going to get there. Christie takes it. And look at the time. 9.87, a lifetime best. They always say the hotter the battle, the sweeter the victory. That was the toughest race I'd ever been in. Of all the races I ran, you know, that was my best race. It was a top, top field. Just blew them apart. And he broke the bridge record as well. To be the first man to hold all four major titles, Olympic, World, European and Commonwealth, over the 100 metre distance, that's outstanding. I met the Queen. I met the Queen after, gosh, Commonwealth Games one year. She gave us the medal after we won. And then I went to Buckingham Palace, you know, she remembered my name and I think, God. Queen Elizabeth remembers my name, sort of thing, you know, she goes, oh, you know, and she goes, oh, hello, Linford. You know, she goes, it's not very often I give, you know, one person, you know, a medal twice. You know, seriously, I just felt proud, you know, for the Queen, actually, you know, she knew who I was, you know, and to me, you know, that's something that's better than all the medals I can win. Linford wasn't just the Olympic 100 metre and world 100 metre champion, he was a proper celebrity. Linford Christie is Ray Charles! Hey, please change from my heart and set me free. Keep on like, you know, the heavyweight boxing champion of the world, they're not just great athletes, they've got a larger than life personality. <laughs> With my time, I enjoyed it. I mean, the worst thing, you know, you grow old, really old. You know, it has to come to an end. Are yeah. you definitely not going to go to the Olympic Games no, I'm, next I'm definitely year. not going. I can't take it anymore. Liv has been tested positive. I thought, well, he stopped racing. What's he doing racing? I used to love it. But have the press turned you off on this? Is it what you're saying, the press, oh, bad publicity? I can't take it anymore. It doesn't surprise me at all that at one stage he spoke about retiring, because he's like that, Linford. You know, he, he said, I'm packing this all in, and then reality would, would, would seep in, and, 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 and he'd get back on track. Was 1996 Atlanta the moment when you realised that my best days are behind me? I needed to get a really good start. If I could get out, I knew that they can't run past me. Away they go, and there's a false start. It may be Christie. He certainly wasn't the favourite by any stretch of the imagination, and it was probably that feeling which pushed him to a false start. Whilst I put my hand up to the first false start, the second definitely wasn't. Great start from Christie out of the blocks, but they're being brought back, oh no! They said, I reacted too soon after the gun. It was just, you know, rubbish. I heard the gun, the gun went. They didn't say I reacted before the gun, they said I reacted too soon after the gun. So it couldn't have been a false start. He always went on the B in bang, didn't he? I still think, to this very day, yeah, I didn't have a false start, did not. Horrible feeling for him because he didn't even get a run, and I, I really sympathise with him on that. But um, does technology lie? Probably not, you know. 
after 96, he wanted to finish then, I think. Had enough of the press, all the press kept saying he can't do it. I got up and just realised, you know, I'm not, not having fun, not enjoying it anymore, you know, it's just so many other things in life. I, you know, I just got fed up with the sacrifice. How did you replace it? Well, I mean, like, you know, the funny thing is, you know, I felt, you know, first of all, that I could have gone on and done another sport because physically I was still in great shape. And then I think I was in Australia or something one day and Colin said to the guy, oh, here's a new coach. And I'm looking around, who's this new coach? And all of a sudden they nominated me as a new coach. I thought, okay, you know, give it a go. They say the best feeling is doing it yourself and the second best is, you know, teaching others. I was invited to come to the meeting in Dortmund to, it was, I think it was a new meet they were open, having on, and they said, you know, the guy said, I will pay you to come and wave to the crowd. Myself and my training partner, Darren Campbell, basically had bet Linford that he couldn't run much quicker than a bus because obviously he was retired at that stage, but Linford thinking he can always run 10-3, whether he's 30 or 55, took up the challenge. You know, I'm a competitor. I love a challenge. Keeps the heart going. And I thought, you know, go on, now give me a lane. Gosh, Christian Malcolm, whom I was coaching at the time, you know, I beat him. You know, it's nice to be back this year to run because I never thought I would even be doing this. So it's, it's a lot of fun. I got selected for, you know, doping and everything else, you know. Not a problem. You know, I, I did my stuff and I went. Someone comes up and says, there's a phone message for you. Linford's been tested positive for a race in Dortmund. I thought, well, as far as I know, he stopped, he stopped racing. What's he doing racing? I was in Australia, you know, with the guys coaching. I got a call from Jocelyn Hoyt-Smith. And she said, oh, you know, I just want to inform you, blah, 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 that you tested positive. <laughs> you know, I, just, I thought it was April Fool's. So I said, you know, you're James. She goes, no, I'm serious. They said it was Nandrula and whatever it is. I said, well, what you need to do, first of all, I need to be tested now. They tested me, nothing in my system. We didn't even know what Nandrolone was. And, you know, it said, gosh, it's got a shelf life, you know, we were, it's got a shelf life of six months or whatever, because it's oil-based and everything else like that. So it should have been in my system. UK Athletics, they had a, an inquiry and everything else, and they came back and said, we don't think you did anything wrong. You have to go to the RWF, your governing body. And Linford chose not to. I mean, why waste money when you're already retired? You know you're never going to run again. Excuse me? Is he a victim or a team? Linford? Linford? Just, what's your opinion? Being caught I'm not going to get into that, but they finally got him. But I'm not going to get into that. Okay. <laughs> it's the thing which kind of offends that you do get people who say he got away with it. You know, but up until then, I mean, you know, John, I didn't give a, you know, I say, I didn't give a shit. You know, because I knew I wasn't doing anything. Nobody has ever come out and said, we got Linford Christie on the list, we know where we got the stuff from, I gave it to him or whatever. So, you know, my conscience is clear. I know I didn't do anything. I still say the German tester has got it wrong. I've never really regarded the positive that he gave in 99 as being a case of bang to rights. He was retired, he was only running for a bit of a joke with his kids he coached. It wasn't necessary for him to take anything. He didn't expect to uh, um, take it anywhere beyond that race in Dortmund. We're not scientists, we make mistakes. You know, but I, you know, until the day I die, I will plead my innocent because I know I didn't do it. And people saying, oh, you know, he's protesting his innocent too much. What am I supposed to do? You've got to get on with, you know, for me, you know, we've had people come out, you know, Seb came out and this and that, you know, to try and, you know, build his career on my back to say, yeah, I did this and blah, blah, blah. For him to come out and say things about me, that's what annoyed me most of all. People out there, they realise if you don't mention Linford Christie, you ain't going to get no space in the papers. It just wasn't a very glorious episode, was it, in British sport when you, you've got two of the greats having um, a, a public disagreement.
mind your business. That's my thing. Don't go around and saying things about people. Until this day, it rankles me that he went out there and he did what he did. And they made out like it was a spat between me and him. It wasn't a spat between me and him. It's just that he said things and I would never talk to him. Never talk to him unless he comes out and he apologised to me for what he did. I think it's really sad that Linford had uh, the meagre involvement that he had in London 2012. You would hope those two would be able to, to sort something out because life's too short to have a, a disagreement like that between two guys of, of that stature. But Linford to miss out on being a key part of London 2012 in his home city was very sad and I'm sure it's something that he wishes he could have been part of because it was a celebration of sport that this country has never seen. It was impossible. He was banned by the British Olympic Association from any contact with the Olympic team and therefore there's no way that any of the stakeholders could allow Linford to be part of it. It would have given too many other people who were opposed to the London bid a chance to criticise it. I'm not a suit and tie man. I don't sit in, you know, being feasted and stuff like that. You know, I coach athletes to try and help them to, you know, do what they do for the sport. Relax, there you go. Keep the shoulders down. How good is he becoming as a coach? Good. He's taking time, but he's finally learned to control himself. He needed patience, which he's never had much patience, but he's gradually getting the eye. He can see what's going wrong and why it's going wrong and put it right. I got to keep shouting at them all the time, telling them to run through the line. I, I owe Ron so much. I owe him my career because if he hadn't written me that letter and hadn't been down there in the track, it rains, snow, sleet. You know, yelling, you know, get your knees up, get your arms up, and you know, pump your arms and doing all these things. And there were the many. Yes, yeah, so I love him. I, I really do love him. I think as you get older, all you want in your life really is contentment. And I hope Linford has got contentment in his life now. <laughs> And those kids that he's coaching, they're the lucky ones. That's when Fulham gave me the freedom of the bar and then they named the stadium after me. That fills me with pride, you know, because I mean, I trained so many days at that track in the snow. I've cried on that track because, you know, training gets so hard. You know, it's nice. I think he sits in a category of his own. You don't even need to say a second name. Everybody knows who Linford is. He was a great ambassador for athletics. He would always do his lap of honour. He would always respond to the public. He would always sign autographs with kids. Absolutely fantastic. That was the side of the character that people remember and made him an athletics hero, and he still is an athletics hero, by the way. What people probably don't know is the Linford Christie outside of athletics, which is soft, kind, generous. There's so many layers to him that it's, it's unbelievable, and I'm just lucky enough. Um, oh, look at me, to, to have had the time and, <clears throat> excuse me, the years to get to know all of them. It's awesome. What would our athletes give for what Linford did at that time? Olympic champion, world champion, European champion, Commonwealth champion. It's a special, special athlete that can put all those four things together at one time. He's the best Britain's ever had as a 100 metre runner. He's quite reasonably regarded as a legend. Not been a bad life, has it? Hey, John, I can't complain. I wouldn't change a thing because I've thoroughly enjoyed, you know, the rough and the smooth together.